He is a Canadian. The United States has sought his extradition to the U.S. for violating the laws of that country while standing on Canadian soil. The crime for which he is charged is punishable by the death penalty or life imprisonment in the U.S. It is a crime typically punished by a fine of not more than $200 in Canada. Who is this Canadian? Why does the USA want him in a cage? Why have liberal and conservative governments in Canada done nothing to prevent his extradition or punishment? Should you care? And if so, what side should you be on? So join me in welcoming this country's, one of this country's greatest um, freedom, well, I don't want to say freedom fighters, how about that? Good word. Good word, all right, all right. One of this country's greatest freedom fighters, none other than Mark Emery. Mark Emery was born in the city of London, Ontario, Canada, in 1958. At the age of 11, he set up his own business selling used comics from home. At the age of 17, he sold his comic business for $6,000. He quit school and opened his own store selling used and rare books. He called the store City Lights. Mark was politically active from an early age. During the Canadian election of 1968, Mark helped his father hammer election signs into the ground for the Socialist New Democratic Party. His support for socialism continued for several years. Then, in 1979, a couple of libertarians passed him a copy of Ayn Rand's book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, a collection of essays dealing primarily with the political aspects of Rand's philosophy, which she called objectivism. My philosophy is based on the concept that reality exists as an objective absolute that man's mind, reason, is his means of perceiving it, and that man needs a rational morality. I am primarily the creator of a new code of morality, which has so far been believed impossible, namely, a morality not based on faith. On or faith. Not on faith, not on arbitrary whim, not on emotion, not on arbitrary edict, mystical or social, but on reason a morality which can be proved by means of logic, which can be demonstrated to be true and necessary. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. And since man's mind is his basic means of survival, I hold that if man wants to live on earth and to live as a human being, he has to hold reason as an absolute, by which I mean that he has to hold the reason as his only guide to action and that he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind, that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness and that he must not force other people nor accept their right to force him, that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. How does your philosophy translate itself into the world of politics? The powers of government are strictly limited. They will have no right to initiate force or compulsion against any citizen except a criminal. Uh, those who have initiated force will be punished by force, and that is the only proper function of government. What we would not permit is the government to initiate force against people who have hurt no one who have not forced anyone. We would not give the government or the majority or any minority the right to take the life or the property of others. I am for an absolute, laissez-faire, free, unregulated economy. Let me put it briefly. I am for the separation of state and economics. I became a convert to radical capitalism in, in the summer of 1979. I saw these two guys, I remember them ever so clearly, Greg Utah, and a guy named Richard Keyes, uh, who were friends of C. Pennebach in 1980. And he said, listen, you look like you have hope. Here, read this book, and has your capitalism, the unknown ideal by Ayn Rand. Mark proceeded to read the rest of Ayn Rand's works of fiction and nonfiction. I've read everything in the Ayn Rand letter, the objectivist form, the objectivist newsletter, every single book she's read. Having been an avid comic book reader and seller throughout his teens, he says he has always seen his own life in comic book terms. I'm glad I've got this really big 
colossal battle uh, coming up because it sort of suits the comic book image I have of myself and of life generally. And in Rand's novel, The Fountainhead, Mark was certainly presented with what would become for him a lifelong hero, Howard Rourke. In The Fountainhead, the Rourke character is an architect. Other architects look for easy money and attain short-lived fame, selling second-hand architectural ideas to people with more money than brains. Meanwhile, Rourke endures bouts of suffering and loss between infrequent opportunities to build masterpieces, masterpieces that are the product of his own exceptionally rational and creative mind. Architects and critics scoff at his novel designs. Fellow architects recommend to him that he put an end to his suffering by compromising his work and his integrity and build mediocre buildings like the ones they build. But to Rourke, the suffering and loss do not matter. He is motivated not by the avoidance of misery, but by the pursuit of his own happiness. In the long run, Rourke gains lasting wealth, love, and personal joy not attainable by the other architects. It is not possible to know to what extent Mark understood the abstract concepts that comprise Rand's philosophy when he first read it, but it is undeniable that Rand's works had a dramatic impact upon him. Immediately gone was his attraction to socialism. When I read that in my backyard one Sunday, and I remember going, Oh my God, I've been wrong all along. I must undo this. In its place was a commitment to individual rights and a lasting admiration for the heroic Rourke character. I said, I'm going to be just like this Howard Rourke guy, because I read The Fountainhead right after Hatler's trip. I'm going to be like this guy. In 1980, Emery began working with the Libertarian Party of Canada. He encouraged a local accountant, Robert Metz, to run for the party in the 1980 federal election. So Mark is desperate on the Friday night, having invested all this money and time into creating a campaign for, I think it was London South at the time, and uh, begged me to run, basically, he said, would, would I run, would I just put my name on the ballot? And so I did him a favor, I said, sure, never heard of the Libertarian Party, that's the Libertarian Party we're talking about now. And um, that was it. Monday morning we get into the high school where we had to go register and Monday afternoon I was a candidate. And next thing I know I'm getting phone calls. And people are asking me my opinion about certain issues and I didn't know anything about the issues and I had no opinions. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I don't know if being a paper candidate is going to work out too good. <laughs> so. Uh, I says to Mark one day, I says, uh, you know, I really should have something to say <laughs> when I go and you know, go to City Lights one day and he just hands me a copy. Here, take this. And it's a copy of Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal. And he points out three chapters in it and he says, you just got to read them. You're all set for the federal election. And indeed I was. That's all it took. For the next ten years, Emery and Metz would work together to build a political party that stood for individual rights. I thought we must have a newspaper. He got the, the bug to be a publisher. And I remember him telling me the first time the idea came into his head to start the London Tribune. In 1980, I uh, had the bright idea in May of that year to start a weekly newspaper. And it's funny, when you talk about somebody slandering you, the Free Press had covered an issue, and I thought quite unfairly about something I was involved in, a tax protest. And I thought, they're not giving me enough coverage. Now, most people would send a letter to the editor. I thought, no, I'm going to put out my own newspaper. And uh, what happened is I uh, got it, did all the information, all the groundwork, an incredible amount of work, and believe it or not, raised $100,000, uh, $20,000 of my own money and $80,000 from other people. I said, three months from now, we're going to have a weekly paper broadsheet, just like the Free Press. And we were up in uh, that building that he showed me where a Freedom Party was eventually to be, downtown. Put it all together in 12 weeks. Had the first issue on the stand, first week in September. The paper was talked about every week. Uh, it went on for about a little over a year. It was very disillusioning. Like what I had set out to do would be a, a truth-seeking, fearless newspaper that would expose and uncover corruption and the truth, blah, blah, blah. And every time I found some corruption, somebody on the board of directors threatened to withdraw their funding because it, it was a friend of theirs or it was uh, a political party they belonged to. And it was amazing how many things got cut in the bud. So consequently, we had no exposés of any, you know, in fact, the board of directors said, Let, let's not offend anybody. Let's go totally middle-of-the-road modeling. And I nearly had a heart attack, because that's not at all what I wanted. The paper eventually uh, was taken over by a couple of its other shareholders. Mark and I were kind of bought out. Having learned from his experiences with the London Tribune, Mark would not make the same mistake twice. In May of 1981, he commenced a solo effort, the Downtown London Metro Bulletin.
Mark would do a lot of publishing in terms of his first Metro Bulletin, which was a little eight and a half by eleven newsletter. Took it to a printer, literally stapled it together. He did the research. He did the investigation. He did the photography. He did the writing. He put it together, and he distributed it. What an intensive work. He'd, make, he'd do that in his home and work hours and hours at night just to put out this newsletter, which he then delivered free to the business community in downtown London. And because of that newsletter, that put him in the paper all the time because he created all kinds of uh, issues and solved problems, too. Um, you know, there, if there was a blight downtown and some owner wasn't cleaning up his storefront, well, he didn't bother with going to City Hall and laying charges. Put, put the guy on the front page of the newsletter and give a copy to everybody. Those places were cleaned up in two, three days flat, right after his newsletter went out. Both Emery and Metz found their short-lived experience with the Libertarian Party to be disappointing. But Libertarians are just terrible to get to run. They come up with more objections to why they should run than the people come up with objections to Libertarian policy when you're on the election campaign trail. You know, everybody always said getting Libertarians together was trying to, you know, like trying to herd cats, you know. I think it, herding cats would be much easier. Both were previously associated with the Libertarian Party, but were dissatisfied with its lack of commitment between elections. So they commenced preparations to form a new provincial political party in Ontario, called the Enterprise Party. But they discovered others in Ontario had broken away from the Libertarian Party of that province to form a new party, called Unparty. My <laughs> guest is Mary Lou Fletcher. She's the chairman of the Unparty. We'll talk about uh, her views on Canada and the views of the Unparty right after these messages. What your party is doing is much more than an Unparty do. It's not a very good name for it, is it? Well, I think you're, you're trying to say that our name means non-party. In fact, uh, Unparty stands for less government. Metz and Emery decided to work with Unparty in their own hometown of London. After the other shareholders at the London Tribune bought out Emery and Metz, they were unable to keep the newspaper afloat. It published its last issue in June of 1981. And they ran it um, into the ground <laughs> for you know a couple of months later. And the next thing we knew, we bought back all the assets for about 50 bucks or something like that. And so we had all of the, um, the equipment. We had the uh, typesetting equipment, the pause one machinery you needed to. This is all old-fashioned newspaper stuff, uh, very fancy stuff. We even had a dark room. We had all the equipment you needed to run a newspaper there. So Mark says, well, I'm going to take my old Metro Bulletin and start running it on newsprint. And we got out four of those. And they were strictly opinion, from cover to cover. The London Metro Bulletin provided Emery and Metz with a place in which to distribute their views on a wide range of various hot topics. The impact of Ayn Rand's philosophy upon Emery becomes clear in a number of the columns he penned. In a column called The Firing Line, Emery wrote, quote, The philosophy where all and any life is sacred, so much so that all others are made slaves to support them, is called altruism. Altruism destroys individuals and society. Abortion of a fetus is justifiable on the purely selfish interests of the woman occupied by the fetus and under no other criteria. The proper role of society should be to institute an environment of individual freedom without the element of coercion between people. In a subsequent rebuttal to letters written in response to his abortion column, Emery wrote, quote, A woman is not a stockyard animal whose only purpose is a biological urge for reproduction. Men are not stud farm animals. Men and women are humans, the only species that chooses their future individually, based on various alternatives or choices. Biology rules the animal kingdom. Decisions and the resulting consequences are what make us human. Unfortunately, our nation is being torn apart by these Christians, feminists, and other altruists who embrace sacrifice of others as their creed. While their short-term political goals, viz. abortion, appear different, their long-term destruction of capitalism, individualism, and free choice is explicit. Sacrifice is the Christian way of life. Theft is the socialist way of achieving all ends. Together, they represent an awesome evil for this nation to confront. In a column titled, In Defense of Hate Literature and Other Passions of the Mind, Emery referred to remarks made by the Montreal-based Center for Research Action on Race Relations. Emery wrote, the director said there is an urgent need for more ethnic journalists in the mainstream news media, particularly the CBC. 
The suggestion made by both groups is that with more minority police officers, jurists, and reporters, and with the laws enforced, that the verdicts rendered and news reported will take on a more ethnic or minority slant. But this view is identical to that of the white supremacists. Both groups are assuming that all Jews think alike, or that all Irish think alike, or that all women feel identical on all issues, or that Catholics will respond in the exact same way. By deduction, we have to assume that those groups believe all men think alike. Otherwise, there would be no problem here, right? This is the same kind of stereotype that Martin Wieschi, a local neo-Nazi, was promoting. That people with a similar cultural history think like zombies, subhumans, and are unable to arrive at independent, non-racial conclusions. If, however, you believe as I do, that all individuals, regardless of race, are capable of independent ideas, devoid of racial influence, and of great diversity, then this insistence on minority influence on everything for a minority point of view can only mean that these people see themselves as a racial group first, and as individual independently thinking human beings last. Emery's editorials at that time took direct aim at those who glorify faith as a means of knowledge, self-sacrifice as a virtue, and force as a mode of governance. Unlike libertarians, Emery did not treat politics as something unconnected to ethics and epistemology. He condemned anti-freedom politics, but he did so by also taking aim at the epistemological and ethical causes of the socialism, racism, and other forms of collectivism that undermine the rational pursuit of one's own happiness. So this newspaper is all my doing. You know, the people we have said are crooks are my doing. The people we have exposed and uh, looked at, all the exposés are, are with my approval, things I wanted to put in there. And that's worth a lot of satisfaction. It's worth losing $8,000 a year. It's worth my public reputation, which is on the line for something I can back up 100%. And uh, that's the difference. That was the end of our publishing career, because at the end of that, sort of politics entered its ugly face. And we folded the London Metro Bulletin. Unparty struggled until 1983, when its founder, Mary Lou Gutcher, decided to transfer control of the party to the one person who was having success in building the party, Robert Metz. I was the only one with any membership growing, and all the rest of them were not surviving, and all I was doing was very routine stuff. After about three years, we lost our major financier, and slowly we lost key people because it's easy to burn out if you're the only one who's working. Now, meanwhile, in London, there was a group of people out there working day after day after day locally, preaching the same message. Well, Mark and I were both uh, in the process of newspaper publishing in 1983, and Freedom Party was actually a uh, previously registered political party that was given to us by a group of people in Toronto who could no longer carry the banner. And uh, they heard about our activity here in the London area, and literally, in late 83, asked us if we'd like to take over a fully registered Ontario political party and use that as a tool in our ongoing quest for individual freedom. Good morning, Michelle. How long has the Freedom Party of Ontario been in operation now? Uh, under its current name, only since January of this year, but it has been a fully registered political party since, uh, oh, about 1980. So it's been about, we're in our fourth year. What was the former name of the, the party? The former name was Unparty. But eventually. Uh, Bob and Mark uh, were the key people in getting the Unparty started in London and changing the name to Freedom Party. And why did you decide to change the name? Well, the name change accompanied uh, not simply a name change, but also a move to London as, as our official headquarters. Um, we thought since Freedom was our product, that the best way to market it would be to name our party after that particular product. I remember going to Toronto, me and a group of Londoners, when we were getting involved with Unparty. Uh, trying to talk them out of the Unparty name, we just thought it was a bad idea. Um, we were all in favor of the word Freedom Party. And uh, it's amazing to us that a group of people who are in favor of freedom didn't want to touch that word with a 10-foot pole. And I'm thinking, that's strange. And even when I went to register the name, I couldn't believe in this land of the freedom where we send our soldiers to die for freedom. There isn't even a fringe party called Freedom Party. Nobody wanted that word like the plague. So I said, geez, there's got to be a reason for that, and I've since discovered what it is. And, um, because none of the other parties are into reality, reason, self, or consent. <laughs> and that's what freedom's all about. The party name was not the only thing that changed. Unparty had been a libertarian party, and, as with all libertarian parties, 
there was a strong anti-government streak within it. Rather than proposing better government, it proposed less government. Whenever you think of protest groups, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's fair to say that uh, everybody thinks, hey, they're left to center. <laughs> but you're not. No, we're neither left nor right, right. we're libertarian. You're libertarian. That's right. But there is a problem with the uh, libertarian philosophy. What is that? That if everything is taken away and a new system is, uh, is introduced with less government, isn't it possible that we would face a form of anarchy where everybody would do their own thing with no restrictions? Wouldn't that be terrible? <laughs> Unparty was not a party just for anarchists, but it was certainly a party that made anarchists feel welcome. And not once in, in my whole career with Mark did we ever have it out on the uh, anarchy versus uh, freedom point of view. Did you get the sense that Mark was coming from one or the other? Of those oh ones? yeah, he was an anarchist. That was, there was no sense about it. That was just clear. So although I am running for office, but I only run for office to educate the public. I actually believe myself to be an anarchist, but you take advantage of all opportunity in our society to educate the public. And that's a good opportunity, so you take advantage of it. And I put a leash on him as far as, uh, we had a tremendous relationship as far as working together. Given that he was the, he was the, he was the piper paying the tune, you know. Any group that I've seen in the past that's ever succeeded has always had at least one major financier. And for those of you who aren't aware of it, for this organization, it's not everyone. And I think we should give him a big hand. And I said, well, I'm not going to take your money unless you accept these conditions. And I don't think you'd find too many people doing that. What were the conditions? Um, they couldn't be a, a, an anarchist under, lib under Freedom Party's banner. End of story. Didn't, didn't say it that way, but today that's a fast way of saying it. Government is the absolute necessity if men are to have individual rights for the simple reason that you do not leave force at the arbitrary whim of other individuals, and your uh, so-called libertarian anarchism is nothing but whim, worship, if you refuse to see this point, because what you refuse to recognize is the need of objectivity among men. So he couldn't be advocating anarchistic ideas, uh, defending freedom on the wrong premise. Um, you could, you, you know, you had to always have that that same message always being delivered on every uh, on every issue the freedom party contends the purpose of government is to protect your freedom of choice not restrict it the freedom party believes that the purpose of government is to protect our individual freedom of choice and not to restrict it we believe that the purpose of government should be to protect your freedom of choice and not to restrict it and with that platform freedom party made it clear that it was a party that regarded government as necessary to a free society a party that rejected libertarianism's anti-government nature. It's a long, hard climb to the Freedom Party's provincial headquarters. Perhaps symbolic of the long, hard climb the party still faces before it reaches political respectability and achieves its goal of getting government off the backs and out of the wallets of the people. We began the first few years of Freedom Party simply outlining a basic strategy, recognizing fully that a political party like Freedom Party would likely not be electable for at least two decades or better. What makes you think that your party is going to be so successful in doing this? Well, success is a difficult thing to measure. If you're speaking in terms of getting elected, that, that's a long-term goal. Right now, our function is to get our ideas out there. A great place to do that is in a political debate. For us, the election certainly isn't a, a viable thing to look at in terms of winning votes, and none of the candidates in our campaign expect to get more than 100 or 200 votes. What's important for the party is that it spreads its message against government intervention, it says. Party candidates say they'll be content if they receive between 1 and 2 percent of the vote this election, as long as they get to air their views. The party only expects to get one or two percent of the vote. The important thing is to field candidates. There's the element of political credibility. Um, can you be electable in the immediate future? Well, that's something when we started this party we knew would be at least a decade or two away. Because uh, credibility in an election is a totally different, it isn't really that related to your ideas directly. It's related more to the credibility of the organization behind the ideas and its consistency and its ability to be there 
election after election. So we had to set out what kind of goals can we set for ourselves that would build our credibility, that would keep us active in the community. And so as a registered political party, we became sort of a lobby group uh, in the name of individual freedom. And we started uh, various campaigns and backed private individuals' campaigns or had our own campaigns or supported other groups that had campaigns that basically agreed with our philosophy. Mark was our, we, we called him our action director, which meant he basically instigated and began um, certain campaigns for the party. What our job is, and especially what my job is, to educate them that freedom is indivisible, that certain aspects of freedom they feel comfortable or more importantly that they see themselves benefiting by. You know, people who like to read adult magazines feel they benefit from no censorship. Uh, people who are in the import-export business feel they're going to benefit from free trade. What they don't go one step further and do is they don't see how it's also the same principle that will allow other people to benefit in areas uh, where they're not concerned. Like a lot of people who believe in free trade don't support the right to smoke marijuana, and yet the two are indivisible. 